Hi, I am Basil Assaf and welcome back to Pathology Dynamics. Last time we discussed canine distemper pneumonia and in this episode we will discuss hyperkeratosis associated with canine distemper viral infection, also called heart pad disease, but we will also take a look at additional lesions that you may see with canine distemper in dogs in other species that are infected with this virus. Just a quick recap of last episode's bronchopneumonia associated with canine distemper, we can see that there are multifocal areas of pulmonary consolidation and hemorrhage. And in histopathology, we discussed large areas of necrotizing pneumonia and inflammation associated with hemorrhage and edema. At a higher magnification, in addition to the necrotizing pneumonia and replacement of the normal architecture with inflammation in areas of necrosis, there are type 2 pneumocyte hyperplasia. And as we had discussed last time, morbillo viruses are typically associated with syncytial cell formation and the presence of intranuclear and intracytoplasmic inclusion bodies. In this episode, we will discuss hyperkeratosis associated with canine distemper viral infection. As you can see here, this is a control animal, and this is a footbed affected by hyperkeratosis due to canine distemper virus. Hyperkeratosis essentially means increased amount of keratin covering the skin. And as we can see here, the surface of the skin is very roughened due to hyperkeratosis, and it looks hard, and that's why it's called hard pad disease. The same lesion could happen on the nose, as we can see here. This is another example of hyperkeratosis. As we said, canine distemper virus can infect other animals in the Mustelidae family. This is an example from a mink. You can see control animal that is not affected here versus an animal with hyperkeratosis of the footbed. And this is example from a skunk. As usual, before we look at the histopathology, let's quickly review the normal skin appearance. The skin is composed essentially of two main layers, the epidermis dermis and the dermis. In addition to a fatty tissue, the hypodermis or the subcutaneous tissue, the epidermis is your exterior layer. Underneath it, there is a softer layer that contains the hair follicles, the oil glands, sebaceous glands, sweat glands, and the blood vessels and nerves that, that feed your skin. On top of the epidermis is a layer of keratin that varies in thickness depending on the location of the skin. On histology, we can see a layer of epidermis, very thin, covered by a very thin layer of keratin. Underneath it, we'll see the dermis, which contains the hair follicle, sebaceous oil gland, and sweat gland. And underneath the dermis is the hypodermis that contains the fatty tissue. Let's take a closer look at the epidermis. The epidermis is a type of epithelium that is classified as stratified squamous epithelium because it's made of squamous cells arranged in layers. It has basal layer followed by the stratum spinosum and it's called spinosum because cells, they have spiny processes that connect cells to each other. On top of it is the granular layer, which contains the purple keratohyaline granules. And on top of it is the stratum corneum that generates eventually the layer of keratin. The skin continuously regenerates. And the way it happens is that removal of the stratum corneum will result in progression of granular layer into the stratum corneum and the stratum spinosum into granular layer. And then the basal layer, which is composed of cells that have stem-like function, will divide and generate new stratum spinosum. And now this is a picture of the foot pad from a dog. And you can see how thicker the epidermis compared to the previous pictures we looked at, and how much thicker is the layer of the keratin. Examined is a section of a foot pad. At the foot pad hair skin junction, we can see the hair follicles in the dermis of the skin here. At this low magnification, we see that diffusely affected the footbed is a marked area of hyperkeratosis. At higher magnification, we can see that the hyperkeratosis is the parakeratotic type, which means that the keratin layer contains retained nuclei. This is as opposed to orthokeratotic hyperkeratosis in which the keratin layer does not contain nuclei. The epidermis is acanthotic, which means it's proliferative, and we can see this most prominently in the basal layer, which is characterized by hyperplasia. At further higher magnification, we can see that some of the keratin 
actinocytes are undergoing ballooning degeneration, and some of them contain intranuclear and intracytoplasmic eosinophilic inclusion bodies, just like those we saw in the lung from the previous video. These are additional examples of intracytoplasmic eosinophilic inclusion bodies. And if you continue to look around, you may see cells that are fused together forming our epithelial viral syncytial cells, such as this one here. This is essentially the hyperkeratosis associated with canine distemper viral infection, which is summarized by perikeratotic hyperkeratosis, hyperplasia of the basal layer of the epidermis, and viral syncytial cells with the intranuclear and intracytoplasmic inclusion bodies. As we mentioned in our last video, canine distemper virus is a ubiquitous infectious disease that affects dogs, other canids, felids, mustelids, and pinnipids. It's a pantropic virus and able to infect multiple organs such as respiratory disease as we saw last time, epithelial cells of the skin as we are seeing this time, and can as well infect the central nervous system. This is a case of canine distemper meningoencephalitis in a sheepdog. We can see already at a low magnification areas of vacuolation in the white matter associated with demyelination. And just like in other organs, we expect to see intranuclear and intracytoplasmic inclusion bodies associated as well with viral syncytial cells. Here is an example of viral syncytia containing three nuclei. Here is the area of demyelination with multiple spheroid formations. And you can occasionally see intranuclear inclusions such as this one here and maybe eosinophilic cytoplasmic inclusion such as these ones here. The meninges as well are inflamed and hence is considered meningoencephalitis. Canine distemper as well can infect the urinary bladder and it's actually a good site to detect the intranuclear and intracytoplasmic inclusions. This is a case from another dog and we can see the bronchopneumonia which is almost similar to what we've seen in the previous video but it's less severe and the urethelium of the bladder is degenerate and sometimes sloughed and we can see evidence of intranuclear and intracytoplasmic inclusions. These are examples of intracytoplasmic inclusions here in addition to the ballooning degeneration of the epithelium. This is probably an intranuclear inclusion. And just to continue the theme here, this is a lung from a dolphin. We can see a large area of necrotizing pneumonia. We can see numerous beautiful viral syncytial cells. And if you look closely, we'll also see intracytoplasmic inclusion bodies and maybe intranuclear inclusion here. And this is as well a section from a seal brain infected with December virus. And if we can look here at higher magnification, we'll see spongiosis and demyelination in addition to syncytial cell formation. There's a good one and here's another. And if you look around, you'll see cells with intracytoplasmic and intranuclear inclusion. This one has a intracytoplasmic eosinophilic inclusion. And finally, this is a case of enamel hypoplasia secondary to canine distemper viral infection in a dog. At higher magnification, you can see the degeneration of ameloplasts with numerous intracytoplasmic inclusions and syncytial cell formation. So as we can see, almost always with distemper viral infection, and for that matter, all morbidly viral infections, they have a common intranuclear and intracytoplasmic eosinophilic inclusions with the formation of multinucleated syncytial cells. They can infect multiple organs. In the lung, we saw bronchopneumonia. In the brain, we saw demyelination and neuronal necrosis. In the foot pad, we saw hyperkeratosis with hyperplasia of the basal layer of the epidermis. And finally, which I haven't yet shared, is lymphoid depletion of lymphoid organs. And this is because Morbelli viruses in general, and canine distemper virus is one of them, as we mentioned, infects lymphocytes through binding to their receptor SLAM, S-L-A-M, and that results in lymphocytolysis and lymphoid depletion, setting up the animal to be susceptible to secondary infections. I hope in these videos, the first part and this part, we covered many of the findings associated with distemper virus. A many thanks to the Joint Pathology Center for providing all these information and all these slide scans. I will put the link for all of these cases in case you are interested in going back to it and read it in more details. And as always, if you like this video, please hit the like button and make sure you view the previous videos. Also, don't forget to spread the word and knowledge by sharing this video with friends and colleagues and please subscribe to the channel so you continue to receive all the new videos. Thank you very much.